Now that we know what a pulse switch modulation signal is, we will move into designing a digital circuit that can generate such a signal. But before I get started doing so or discussing the design of the circuit, I want to go through the main characteristic of a pulse switch modulation signal. So generally speaking, a pulse switch modulation signal will have what we call a duty cycle. So a duty cycle, which I'm going to call D, is the thing that actually control or the property or the characteristic that control the amount of voltage or power delivered to an analog device. And we have se separately discussed it in a separate segment. So the second, the second actually property or characteristic of a pulse switch modulation signal is actually the resolution. And as it turns out that this D is duty cycle goes from zero all the way to 100% or one and any number in between. And because it is a real number, we have an infinite number of possibilities for duty cycle. However, we're about to design a digital system and in digital systems, we can't have an infinite number of numbers. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a, a smaller subset of it and the number of possibilities that I can have between zero and one is usually defined about what we call the resolution. So the resolution is short is in short is just the granularity of the duty cycle like do I want it to move zero to 0 0.001 and then 0 0.002 and that is usually defined by an R what which is the resolution. Okay, so what is R? Well, usually R is, is the number of bits within the storage element. So the circuit we're about to design have a storage element and R is the number of bits that it can store. So I'm gonna explain it with an example. So let's assume that you decided that R is eight bits. That means you will have some sort of a storage element that goes from zero all the way to 256 or 255, okay? Something like that. We're gonna discuss the 256, 255 in a separate, like in later videos. But the point that I'm trying to make in here is you are are dividing that range in here between 0 and 1 into into 256 periods or intervals which each one of them is actually 1 over 2 to the power r so in the case of 8 bits that means each one of them is 1 over 256 that's what you're trying to do so that means at 0 if the count is 0 you have 0 over 256 that's a duty cycle if you then you can have a 1 over 256 as a duty cycle and 2 over 2, 256 um, 2 divided by 256 all the way to 256 by 256 and yes that's not a typo and it's not a mistake and we're going to discuss it shortly when we talk about the design this is 256 by 256 which is equivalent to one and this in here is zero so what i'm trying to say in here is i i need a duty cycle that go between zero and one and i can't have an infinite number of possibilities in between them so i'm gonna have to to dissect or or discretize that range between zero and one based on r so that's what i'm about what what i just did in here the last main characteristic of a pulse switch modulation signal is actually the switching frequency. As you might know by now, a pulse switch modulated signal is just a square wave. Yes, it might have a different duty cycle. For example, it might stay in the on position less than the off position. However, it's still a periodic square wave. So because it's periodic square wave, it does have what we call a frequency and specifically we name it switching frequency for pulse switch modulation. And we're gonna call it FPWM. Sometimes we're gonna use TPWM for the period of the pulse switch modulation signal. But why do I care about the frequencies? Well, it turns out that this particular signal will be connected to different analog devices. If you connect it to an LED, uh, 10 hertz might be like, for example, a 10 hertz connected to an LED might be a little bit on the slower side and you will see different brightness on the on the LED, but you will also see it flickering because it is actually turning on and off and you can see that. And of course, if you actually put it to, to the one megahertz, you, the physics of the LED might not let it completely turn off and you might not see it, so you will lose the effect. So you need to have something somewhere in the middle, maybe one kilohertz, two kilohertz or something like that. If you connect that pulse switch modulated signal to not an LED, but to a motor drive or something, you might want to see something within the kilohertz or even 10 kilohertz. And a pulse switch modulation signal actually can be used um, uh, with audio amplifiers and power supplies, and it can take in 100 kilohertz. The bottom line is you want to be able to control your switching frequency. So the main three characteristics that we're going to control is a duty cycle. We will also make a decision to define the resolution. Okay. So if you want, like, so for example, 0 0.5, you might not be able to get it based on this resolution. You might need to increase the resolution so that you get that exact number. And finally, we're going to talk about the switching frequency. So I'll start by the most basic design for a pulse switch modulation circuit. 
And in this particular design, I'll only consider the first two characteristic, which is the duty cycle and the resolution. And we'll worry about the switching frequency later. We're going to update that design so that it takes care of the switching frequency. For now, for simplicity, so that we understand how the circuit works in general, we're just going to focus on these two things at the beginning. Okay, so the main two components of this particular design is just an up counter, and it's specifically of size R bit, that's actually the resolution, and followed by a simple small combinational circuit, which is just a comparator. And the comparator tells me if the input in here coming from the counter is actually less than the comparator, that comparator will be asserted. So how does this actual circuit work? Well, here's how it works. So the counter, let's assume that this counter for the sake of this example is eight bits. That means it should go from zero, uh, one, two, all the way, it's gonna go to 255. Okay, and then you put some sort of a duty cycle. Let's assume that you decided that the duty cycle is 128. Okay, and the duty cycle is also R bits. Okay, it's the same size of the up counter. So what happens in here is this counter counts zero, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And the comparator is actually comparing. Did I reach 128? Did I not? Like, or is it less than 128? If it is less than 28, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's assert the output in here at one. I'm going to do it one more time. When the count is at one, I will actually assert it as well because it's still less than 128. And I'll go all the way there, all the way there. So I'm going to go from here all the way till I get the 128. So when this counter is at 128, so now I have 128. This is not exactly, it's not equal to or less than, it's, it's exactly less than. It's, um, so 128 is not less than 128. So what happens is this actually gets dropped down in here. And then you will see it for the rest of the count all the way to 255, you're going to get that is a zero. And then it repeats because that counter goes back to the zero. And then you have the same exact signal going all the way up to one. And it stays for one for a certain period of time. And then it goes back to zero and so forth. So that actually the duty in here actually controls the duty cycle. So this number, because you can control how long it does, uh, like where it actually is, this controls the duty cycle. So exactly how we, how do we compute it? Well, here's the deal. So we started with a counter of zero all the way to 128. Okay, and let's assume that that's 128. So the duty cycle is actually between zero all the way to 128. And that is, um, that's basically the number here. So we can we can say that, hey, we have 129 divided by 256 and that's um, my duty cycle okay that's if, if i'm actually saying or actually it's not 128 because at 20, 128 will up with zero so really that is here if you really think about it that's exactly at 127 it will be high so that it'll be at 127 divided by 256 and that will be my duty cycle of the pulse switch modulation signal on the output in here so let's go to Vivado and write some code to describe this particular circuit. It is really straightforward because all we have to do is just put some sort of an up counter in here, which is just a register that can just increment itself and followed by a comparator. And what I did is I went ahead here and I actually started uh, the code and I said, okay, let's parameterize the R, which is the resolution. And then the duty cycle will be an input so that I can change the duty cycle of the output that I'm generating right here. And of course we need a clock and a reset and this is the pulse switch modulation output in here. And what I did in here is I just described a counter. Of course you can go and instantiate a counter that we've developed before, but I felt like, hey, we can just do it right here. It's very straightforward. All you have to do is just say, uh, you deal with the reset and then you, this counter always counts up. There's no enable for it. There's no nothing. We can add the enable, but just for simplicity, we're just gonna make sure that this counter is always counting up. So how do I deal with a comparator here? Of course, I can go ahead and develop a fully fledged comparator, but I really don't need to. All I have to do is just say, well, this is actually the output logic. So this is this is the third part of any digital or in a generic uh, synchronous digital system. So all I have to do is just say, well, I'm going to assign uh, the PWM out. OK, I'm going just to assign it to what? Well, I will test the Q reg. And I'm going to just make sure that it's less than a duty cycle. So I'm just going to use the Verilog operator of less than, and that's it. That particular circuit now generates a pulse switch modulated signal that is based on duty. Of course, you're going to have to compute the duty cycle based on this number in here. And if we go back to this particular diagram in here, just to figure out what duty should be or how do we compute it, the way you compute it is the following. It actually goes from zero all the way to, let's say, duty minus one that's actually here so we put the number 128 at 128 it will actually go to zero so this here actually stays 
in the arm position from 0 all the way to 127, which is due to minus 1. So really, the pulse switch modulated signal that you get in here has a duty cycle that is actually duty minus 1 divided by 2 to the power r. And that's how we actually can compute it, 2 to the power r, yeah, 256. That's that's actually the duty cycle that we get. So you can compute the based on what duty cycle or what duty cycle you want, you can compute that number in here and basis. For example, let's assume that you need something that is 50%, you just say 0 0.5, and you go ahead and substitute the numbers and you put it, and it will change it. So I went ahead and I wrote a simple test bench for this pulse width modulation signal so that just so that you can see it in action. And I really, all I did is I defined some signals, instantiated the unit under test and generated like a clock. And all I did is I just basically reset it and then started changing the duty. So I did a duty cycle here, a duty, another one here and duty, another one here. Really what I did is I generated 25%, 50% and 75%. Okay, so let's take a look at the um, diagram here the, or the uh, timing diagram that we get. And you can see at the beginning in here, I calculated the duty cycle to be 64. Really, if you compute, I mean, of course, it's not going to be exactly 50% if you think about it. Um, 64 d minus 1, this is the number that we place, which is 63 divided by 256. You're not going to get exactly 25%, but it's extremely close. And you can see it in here. The signal is about 25% in the on position, 75% in the off position. Then at some point in here, I'm actually changing it to 128. If you're actually computing that 128, it will be approximately 50% of that. Not exactly, but approximately. It's going to be the duty cycle is going to be 128 minus 1 divided by that. And you can compute that number in here, for example, by saying it. Uh, we can just say, well, let's do this in here. And then um, why don't we just do that here? Okay, we can uh, just do this and then another one in here and another one and i can just basically add another marker and another marker in here and another marker in here okay and you can see it i added these markers so you'll see that between here and here is 1.275 microsecond and then if i actually stop in here to see it it's the then it stays for 1.28 microsecond it's not 1.75 so there's a slight difference even though that i wanted it to be um 50 percent if I want it to be really closer to the 50%, all I have to do is just change the resolution, increase it. And of course it increased the size or the number of flip-flops that you use in the circuit. So if you needed to, you can, you can get to that, but that's close enough. And at the very end in here, what I did is I actually moved that so that that's approximately 75% in the on position, 25% in the, in the off position. So this basic design serves the purpose. It actually gives me a pulse switch modulation signal. But it has some issues, so let's discuss these issues. So I cleared my screen here, and let's talk about these issues. The first one is that 256 and 255. So this counter, it can go all the way, or it can count from 0, 1, 2, all the way. It can go all the way to 255 because it's an R-bit counter, okay? Or it's all the way, let me just write it in a generic way, or, or like um, generic term, is 2 to the power R minus 1. It goes from 0 all the way to 2 to the power R minus 1. I'm just explaining everything with an example where R is 8. Okay, so now if the duty cycle in here, you decided that you want it to 0, all you have to do is just put a 0 in here. And of course, if is 0 less than 0, no, it's going to start at the 0 position and it goes all the way to 0 and it stays at 0. And then what you have is a duty cycle that is 0%. So there's no problem with the 0. However, let's assume that if this is an R bit, that means the maximum number you can actually place on that duty cycle or duty is actually 2 to the power R minus 1, which is in the, uh, in the 8 bit uh, case, it's actually 255. So let's see that final exact final value. So the final value you're going to get is you're going to tell me, well, 255 in here, is, it, is 255 less than 255? And the answer is no. So what's going to happen is you're going to get that goes to zero. What I'm saying in here is, if you place this as 255, it'll count to zero, it'll go to one. It'll count one, it'll stay at one, and it'll stay at one all the way till it reaches the very last number here, which is 255. And at that exact 255, it'll compare it to 255 and it'll figure out it's not exactly less. So it's just gonna go down a little bit and then moves up again for the next count and it continues. So it's close to 100%, but not exactly. And the problem is, that 255 in here and the, and the 255. And of course, if, if you've seen the previous slides, we have computed that actually in order to get anything you, or, or in order to compute that number, you're gonna have duty uh, minus one divided by 256. And of course, that's the maximum number we can get, which is, um, which, is not, which is not 100%. So how do I get 100%? 
Well, the solution is really easy. All you have to do is just add a bit to this. And now you can actually place 256 in here. So you don't need to do that now. You can actually go to 256. Actually, you can go to 2R plus 1 minus 1 in here, which means that you can put to 256. But frankly speaking, any number 256 or above, it's just going to actually output 1 in here. And I'm not going to reach it because that, that counter doesn't go to 256. But I mean, anyway, the bottom line is if you put 256, you will have to do basically duty cycle or um, duty minus, actually it's duty divided by 256 because it goes from zero all the way to duty minus one, which is the total is actually just duty. So the very first fix we need to do with the circuit is just make sure that duty is actually R plus one. That's what we need to do. Now, the next thing we need to do is the switching frequency. So as you might recall, we started with a basic design that doesn't allow me to control the frequency of the signal in here. So let's figure out what is the frequency that I'm operating at if I actually use this particular design. So I went ahead and I wrote a few things in here to, um, to make things a little bit faster. And here's it is. So here's my design. Of course, the modified one will have a R plus one, but this should not affect my frequency. But anyway. So the first thing we need to, the, to do is like f figure out some terms. So what we have is we have some system clock period. It's actually different than the switching frequency. It's actually for the whole system, all of them. This is basically you connect that. And in our cases, we're using a board that has 100 megahertz. So or 100 megahertz frequency, which is 10 nanoseconds if we're dealing with a clock period. OK, so that's the system clock. OK, and what we're really after is what we call the pulse switch modulation period or the switching period. The switching frequency is just a reciprocal of that. And if you really if we're about to compute it, the way it actually does it, it actually goes this. This counter goes all the way from zero all the way to 255. So it really is the total. Well, in the case of eight bits, it's actually 256 counts. And I know from the basics of timers and counters that I need 256 times that system clock which is two to the power of R times two to the sys here or to the two system clock to figure out the total period. Okay. Again, the total period in here is actually the counter goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 255 in the case of eight bits or two to the power of R. And it takes me from here to here exactly 256 or two to the power of R clock cycles. And that's basically what we have. So the period for this particular signal that is outputted in here will be computed that way. And of course, if you need the switching frequency, all you have to do is just take the reciprocal and I just basically put this here in the reciprocal. So let's do a very quick example. So in this example, I'm computing the, pre the frequency or the switching frequency for this particular pulse width modulation signal coming out of from this circuit, the one that we saw in the test bench as well. And you'll see if in the case of 8-bit and a clock period that is actually 100 megahertz or 10 nanoseconds, you'll see if you calculate it that the switching frequency is 390 kilohertz. So we need to enhance the pulse switch modulation design to include some other additional um, additional component that allows me to slow down the clock or actually control the up counter in here. And the solution is straightforward. We have seen it before. It's actually just adding a timer. OK, and all you have to do is just add a timer that ticks. Usually it generates a little tiny ticks or what we call done ticks in here. So this timer will operate to the 100 megahertz. This will operate to the 100 megahertz. So what it will do instead of this counter counting exactly at every clock cycle, it will count exactly when this timer finishes. So the timer now um, controls when it ticks. So we can calculate the frequency or the switching frequency here. So let's do that. So what I'm doing is I'm keeping the clock period in here. That clock will be feeding here and it will be feeding here. It's the same exact clock. It's the 100 megahertz. However, now the pulse switch modulation period is a little bit different. The pulse switch modulation period is actually this has to go from zero all the way to two to the power of R. That's for sure. OK, but now I'm not multiplying it only by the system clock. I'm also it's waiting for the whole timer to actually finish. So the timer actually usually have some sort of a final value in here that we feed it to. So it's actually T system time timer value plus one because the timer value is or the final value is actually inclusive. And you'll get that particular number in here for the period for the pulse switch modulation period. Of course, if you need the switching frequency, all you have to do is just take the reciprocal of that and that and then you get it. Typically speaking, what we're really after is controlling that timer in here. And we usually control that timer by the timer final value. So all you have to do is just a little bit of algebra. What I'm saying in here is the previous design told me without any timer that if you want to change the switching frequency, you will have to change R or you will have to change the clock period in here or the system clock. 
Typically, you can't control the system clock, it's pretty set. And if you're changing the R, you're also changing the resolution. What if you're happy with that resolution and you don't want more because you don't want to utilize more flip-flops or something? So that's a, not an acceptable solution. So the new enhanced one, it's telling me the following. Now, if you want the, to change the frequency or the, the switching frequency, you can change to the power R or you don't. You don't have to. You can change the system clock or you don't have to. Or you can just change the timer final value. So what we're really after is we know this guy and what we need to figure out is what the timer final value is to get that particular switching frequency. So you do a little bit of algebra and you get this equation. Uh, keep that equation handy because every single time you're going to use the pulse switch modulation signal and you want to figure out exact frequency that you need, you're going to have to figure out what the final value is. And all you have to do is just substitute some numbers. So in this example, I, I just replicated the example that we did before and we said, okay, two to the power eight, this is because my resolution is eight bit. And then I have 10 nanosecond in here. And I decided that the switching frequency, I want it to be two kilohertz or 2000 hertz. And I calculated that number in that final value for this particular timer will have to be 194.3125. So you're gonna have to make the decision whether it's 194 or 195. And it'll exa you're not gonna get exactly 2000 hertz. You're gonna get a little bit above or a little bit below, which is fine. So one final improvement before we jump into coding. So here's the timer and I'm now included the final value as an input. Of course, you can use a timer with the final value as a parameter, but generally speaking, you want to be able like, or we're going to design a circuit that we can change the final value, which means we can change the switching frequency by an input. So it's dynamic and we can change the duty cycle. So the final improvement I'm doing is here and it's just, I'm just adding a flip flop and let me explain why. So this comparator is a combinational circuit. This here is a sequential circuit. So what happens in here is when the timer comes in and it's enabled or something like that, and let's assume that you have zero, one, one, zero, the number doesn't matter at this point, but what happens is now you're moving up one, one position. And let's assume that moving up one position means that this, um, maybe, maybe let's do it that way. It's, uh, let's do it that way in here. You, sometimes what you have is you wanna to move to the next position. So what you need to do is new, moving to the next number, meaning this will have to go to zero, this will have to go to zero, and this will have to go to one. So the next value is going to be, uh, let's say zero, zero, one. Let's assume that everything else stays the same. What I'm trying to say in here is I have three bits being changed or they get flipped. So this here is usually constructed with physical components and these physical components, maybe one of the numbers will switch before the other one. So at the output in here, I might get some intermediary numbers that are wrong till everything stabilizes. And because this is a combinational circuit, and if this number just happened to be for some reason or another year, like it changes and it drops, below that duty in here or above that duty, it will change the comparator right away because this does not operate at the clock cycle. As you can see, the clock is only here and here. So what we need to do is we need to place some sort of a flip-flop to avoid these glitches. So what I'm saying in here, if you take the output of the pulse switch modulation directly from the comparator, you might get like really a nice, but then all of a sudden you have like this tiny little glitch that has nothing to do with the actual pulse switch modulation that you have because this one here is changing and the comparator actually is faster than the clock. So having a D flip flop in here will will actually eliminate these particular um, these particular switches. So I'm gonna have like a much cleaner pulse switch modulation signal. So let's go to Vivado and just write code to describe this particular circuit. So we now move into Vivado to write code to describe this final design for a pulse switch modulation uh, circuit. And what I did is I went and I copied the pulse switch modulation basic and we're gonna just go or start from there because remember it's just a few improvements. So the very first improvement we have done is actually increase the duty input to, to R plus one. So all I have to do is just basically remove that minus one in here and that solves this particular issue. And then the next one is the up counter did not change. Actually it changed, it changed a tiny bit because we're gonna to have to add some sort of an enable to it. Of course, again, we can instantiate the, the, the up counter and then the timer. But I'm just going to show you a different way of doing this here. I'll just I'll just modify the code a little bit here. So what we need to do is we need to add a timer. So I have written timer before, so I just imported the timer input and I'm just going to use it. So usually what I do is I just open this here on the side so that I get to see the input and output. And I'm really going to do is the, the thing I'm going to do is the following in here. I'm just going to say, OK, let's say this is what we call usually it's a prescaler. Um, timer okay and then we can say timer input and all i have to do is just basically figure out the number of bits that it needs okay as a parameter 
And if you take a look at that in here, we're gonna have to figure out what the timer bits are. And I don't think it's specified anywhere. So what I will do is I'll actually expose it to the outside world in here as another timer. But just in case so that I don't confuse, is it the bits for the counter or the timer? I'm just going to call this here as timer bits. And I'm by default, I'm just gonna set it up to 15. Okay, so again, you can specify a couple of parameters if you want to. So that bits actually specifies timer bits in here. Now my timer input is actually specified, or at least its parameters are specified. I'm just gonna call it timer zero. And then I'm going to do this, this here and this here. And then what I need to do is just say connect clock to clock. And then here reset n to reset n. I believe there's a reset somewhere here. Yes, we're gonna connect that here. Dot enable. Uh, we're gonna well, we're gonna connect it to something. We'll figure out what it is. Well, this actually enables the timer. I don't want to disable the timer. I don't see a purpose for doing this. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna connect it to uh, one to make sure it's always enabled. And of course, the final value in here actually should be exposed to the outside world. Uh, this improved this improved design exposed the final value in here. So I'm just going to do that in here. I'm just gonna say, well, it's input. And of course, because it's timer, uh, I believe it should be timer bits, underscore bits, minus one, all the way to zero. And that's final value. And it's the same exact thing in here. It's the same here. So it's final value final value okay and then the last one in here is to figure out what do we need to do for the done or the tick i will say done you can call it done you can call it tick i'm just going to use tick because we, you will see it and usually i define in here and i'm going to say well i need a wire called tick this is just this little tiny wire in here okay i called the signal coming out of the timer tick and i'm just going to connect that tick today to some sort of an enable for the up counter frank speaking i need to go and modify the up counter a little bit so that it has it accounts for that tick so i have to go in here and figure out where to calculate it i believe if i just do it right here it, it will serve that purpose and then i can say well else in here i can say qreg is the same as qreg if anything else it shouldn't change so what i have just done in here is i kept the reset the reset will actually reset the counter it will also this is the one here it will also reset the timer by the way which is here okay and then that done tick in here which is this little guy i added it as an enable i didn't call it an enable explicitly but it's obvious in here it's basically just an enabling signal here and that basically does it at least for this part so what we need to do as well is we need to modify this one here which we can include a d flip flop we can we can just go and figure out a d flip flop from a previous lecture or previous video but what i will do is i'll just show you a different design sometimes you just want something on the fly you don't want to go through all your codes you wrote so what i will do is i'll actually add it in here it's a sequential circuit so i can add it within this always statement this is the register part and this is the next state logic part so i can just add them in here okay so it's a single bit so all i need to do is just define it i'm going to call it dreg and d next Okay, and then what I can do is I can just go in here and just modify that signal a little bit or these um, codes in here a little bit. And now I'm including not only the register or the counter in here, I'm also including the D flip flop. Of course, I could have also done the timer, but I just didn't want to complicate it or overcomplicate it too much. So we can say D reg equals just a binary zero. And specifically, this one is one. I know for sure it's a one. And then here I can say begin. This part, I believe it's not obvious on the diagram. I didn't want to overcomplicate it, but um, what I'm doing is I'm also connecting that done in here to some sort of an enable to that here. So it only changes when the timer actually ticks. Okay, and then here it's actually dreg is equal to the next. Okay, and the final one in here, I'm gonna do begin, I'm going to do here and then end. And then here I can say dreg is equal to dreg. And I believe this is um, the, uh, this is just the sequential part. We need to figure out what the next state part and the next state is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is just say d next is equal to, and let's see, what should d next be? Well, it's the output of the comparator. So all I have to do is just actually just cut this little guy in here and just paste it in here. That's what we did. Now, of course, the pulse switch modulation is the same as the output of the, the flip-flop. And I believe that ends it here. And that's basically the improved design. So at the, at the end of the day, what you have is you have a pulse switch modulation. I called it the pulse switch modulation improved. You can call it just PWM. It takes a couple of parameters. The first one is actually controls the resolution for the duty cycle. And the other one is uh, related to the timer itself. You need to figure out how many bits that timers need. 
Uh, of course, you could have calculated it by the value of the final value if you choose to, but I just chose to just pass it as a value. If you specify a value, make sure you have enough bits for that timer and then a clock and a reset. And then you provide it with a duty cycle that is a little bit, it's R plus one. So it's exactly nine bits in this case, or like by default. And then you provide it with a final value that we compute using this particular equation in here. And that equation will give me the different values. So for example, in a, in a next example, I'm just gonna use like a number close to this to generate a pulse switch modulation that's two kilohertz. And I have an output, which is actually the pulse switch modulation signal that I need.